Anger is passion gone wrong. I said this to a brother one time um, that I was counseling at a previous church. He felt so much despair in his relationship with God. He determined this despair because he had bursts of rage and anger that there's something wrong. But I reframed it for him. That which is good had become twisted and turned into a form that manifests in painful expressions that hurt the self and others. I said, brother, your problem isn't that you have anger. Your problem is that you're not recognizing where it stems from. The outward manifestation of this anger that he had, he was making a determination about who he was as a person. And I said, here's the reality. You are a passionate person. You're an expressive person. You are a thoughtful person. You are introspective. You are a mindful person. And these are the reasons why so many things matter to you. These things, these good things, have become negatively affected by pain in your life. And you express these wonderful things in a harmful way. So let's, yes, the anger is a problem. Yes, yes, that can cause hurt and trouble around you. But to get to the root of it is not to address the external behavior. Let's deal with who you are. And that was a moment of breakthrough for this brother. Our greatest sins and our greatest idolatry stem not from something vile or something immoral that we do. It actually stems from the most good things in our lives. The most good things in our lives. We have a story before us today. And it's interesting. As we read the story of Solomon, it starts off right off the bat saying that, that, that Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh and starts listening, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, and, and he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and you get blown away by this number, perhaps. It's like, oh my goodness, how could this person, how could Solomon do this? But one of the things that really stuck out to me as I was reading this account of Solomon was that God was angry at Solomon Not for those things. Not saying that God is in favor of that. But because his heart was turned away from God. See, God goes to the root of the problem. God doesn't take a look at just the external manifestations of our behaviors and and the life choices that we make and start indicting us for those things. God gets to to the very heart of who we are and trying to get to the root of it. Solomon's main problem is that he had lost sight of who God is. We have a story before us today that goes against everything that we thought Solomon would be like. Because two weeks ago, as we began the story of Solomon, he does, he does something amazing, doesn't he? God says, I'll give you anything you want. Just ask. And Solomon says, I want an understanding heart. God, who can rule all of these people? Who can... Who can judge them well? I I need discernment and wisdom, but in order to have those things, I need to have an understanding heart. And yet, the story that Gilbert read for us today reveals the complete opposite of such an answer to prayer. Where did all the wisdom and discernment go? What happened to his understanding heart? What was in his heart? How did Solomon reach a place where he was worshiping so many idols. He didn't just allow for the building of different worship sites. He went after them as well. He began to worship other idols. How did he end up with over 1,000 women in his life? How did he become like this? Idolatry stems from good things. Our hearts are idol-making factories, John Calvin says. Our hearts are are idol-making factories that make good gifts from God ultimate in our lives, thereby replacing God in our affections. Tim Keller writes, what is an idol? Is anything more important to you than God? Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God? Anything you seek to give you what only God can give to you? Think about Adam and Eve's fall to sin. What was so wrong about understanding of knowledge of good and evil? What was so wrong 
about eating a fruit. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Everything. Everything went wrong. Idol worshiping happens as a result of something good going wrong. Solomon's idols stem from God's gift of understanding. God gives him a gift of this thing called understanding. And with that, he starts to seek understanding in all other areas. Solomon was given a, a gift to understand the heart of God. But with that gift, Solomon started to understand other things. And wanting to know more and more and more and more. Idols do not come from some really evil, immoral, vile place. Idols come, happen because we are oblivious. And we're oblivious to good things. We're naturally oblivious to good things. That's probably the last place you're going to check to see if you're worshiping an idol or not. Idolatry stems from the things that are good in our lives. In fact, the more good they are, the more likely they'll become an idol. Perhaps you already have an idol or idols of the good things in your life. Solomon loved many foreign women. Is this a problem of racial diversity? No. This is a problem of faithfulness before God. Because even in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant ways, there was always room for foreigners among God's people. In fact, God's law provides of how non-Jews are supposed to be treated and how they're supposed to be included into the religious and cultural life of the people. Therefore, this is not about racial diversity. This is all about allegiance and faithfulness to God. So the problem of Solomon was not marriage to foreign women, but that in that, the underlying root was that he did not uphold the worship of God of Israel. The king of Israel was to uphold the God of Israel. Yet, he was marrying many foreign women who did not worship the God of Israel. And we know through human history that a lot of times marriages happen to establish peace treaties between different nations. And such was the case for Solomon. Yet, the greater problem for Solomon is that he held on to this in love, the scripture says. His heart's affection went to his marriages. His heart's affection went to his love for these women. This in turn caused his heart to be divided into so many different directions in regards to worship. And what did this disobedience lead Solomon to do? He allowed the worship of other gods. He even went after these gods in worship. And the first god that is listed in this text is Ashtoreth of the Sidonians. And Ashtoreth is uh, representing a productive power of nature. This, this Ashtoreth was a, uh, a primary goddess worshipped by ancient Canaanites. We read about it even among the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 31. And the Israelites started to worship Ashtoreth even as early as as soon as Joshua dies. In Judges chapter 2, as soon as, shortly after Joshua dies, the Israelites are already starting to worship other gods and Ashtoreth is part of that. And in this account, Milcom, Chemosh, and Molech, they're all actually, they're actually the same god. They're the same idol. And they represent, he, he represents a, a financial prosperity. But, but in worshiping this god, Milcom, or Chemosh, or Molech, it was about um, sacrificing human beings. It was about sacrificing, especially, especially child sacrifice was part of this worship. And, and Solomon allowed for that. So God gets really angry with Solomon. For these acts, yes, but so much more importantly, his heart. His heart that turns away from worshiping the God the way his father David did and starts to allow for this kind of idol worship. It goes deeper and it cuts deeper than acts of worship because acts of worship stem from a deep root of affection and love for things, beings, people, gods, and ideas. Worship is only a natural extension of the affections of your heart. We all worship something. The problem is not whether we are people of faith or worshipers. We all worship, we all believe in something. The question is who or what. God gets angry with Solomon because, God, because Solomon's heart turns away from God. A.W. Tozer is this famous pastor who wrote the book Attributes of God or knowledge of the holy. You, may, you might have come across these books. Um, and this is what he said. 
Uh, once, what's closest to your heart is what you talk about. And if God is close to your heart, you'll talk about him. This is a litmus test to know who is sitting on the throne of your heart. What is closest to your heart is what you're going to talk about. And if God is close to your heart, you'll talk about him. What a litmus test. What do you find yourself just naturally talking about? That is one indicator of where your ideas, your thoughts, your heart, your affections are fixated on. And that's one way of saying idolatry. Where are you turning to in order to secure the production of your life? The Israelites were starting to turn to Ashtoreth. Where are you turning to in order to secure your financial well-being? They were turning to Milcom. What about our days today? What about our culture today? Where are you turning to in order to secure the production of your life? Whatever things you do to produce out of your being, your work, your activities, your relationships with people. Where are you turning to in order to secure that production? It could be yourself. It could be someone else. It could be an idea. Where are you turning to in order to secure your financial well-being? The same thing. And, and, and this where that we turn to are often the good things in our lives. It's often the good things in our lives that we can look to it to try to find that security. And the challenge before us is that we bring this, it's such a heavy word for me to say, we don't like saying these words, but it's to bring my idolatrous heart before the Lord. We live in a culture that saying these kinds of words is hard to swallow. To say idolatry Yes, idolatry. It's, it's the first commandment among the Ten Commandments. You shall not have other gods before me. Our hearts are idol-making factories that make good gifts from God ultimate in our lives, thereby replacing God in our affections. Tim Keller rephrases it like this. He says, the human heart is an idol factory that takes good things like a successful career, love, material possessions, even family, and turns them into ultimate things. Our hearts deify them as the center of our lives because we think they can give us significance and security, safety, and fulfillment if we attain them. But what happens when you get there? There's a great book on this, Counterfeit Gods. I highly recommend it. Counterfeit Gods by Tim Keller. Read it. It'll just change your scope on your view on how, how, all of the, how, how you navigate these, these big things that are so present in our face in our culture, right? I mean, he brings up things that are so important to us, our careers, love, materials, possessions, family. And who would think that those can become gods in our lives? And yet they do. And this book will really help you look at those things from a very gospel-centered freedom so that you can engage those things. His, this, this, the call of the gospel is not to remove yourself from any of these things. The call of the gospel, the call of Christ, is so that you don't live enslaved to these things. And you are free to engage your career, love, material possessions, and even your family without making them your ultimate thing and allowing God to be your ultimate thing. Did you know you can make your family into an idol? The more precious and good it is, the more it will certainly be an idol unbeknownst to you. These idols will become most precious and valuable to you. How do you know you are making idols of these good things? I had to ask myself this question. I, I, I spoke with a few folks in our church this week saying, I'm wrestling through this text this week. I didn't choose it. The education ministry chose it for me. And we're going to the same text in all of our ministries. It's part of our curriculum. And so I take this text and I, I sit with it. I wrestle with it. And I ask myself about it. In what ways are the good things in my life the ultimate thing? Are they? Are they? How do you know 
that you are making idols of these good things? Do you engage these things out of freedom? Are you driven by them? Let us ask ourselves this question. And some practical ways is to think about, look at, look at how you're, you're emotionally or mentally affected when these things go wrong. And they always go wrong. They always go wrong. None of these things go well all the time. They always go wrong. So how do you get affected emotionally and mentally? Are these sources of anxiety? Does your life begin to crumble when these good things in your life start to shake? Children can be your idol if you're a parent. And oftentimes the way that the culture that we live in right now in raising children is that they become our gods. Raising children become our idols and gods. And as parents, instead of teaching them to serve God Almighty with their life and live their life in, according to God's good purpose over them and teach them to worship and to be God conscious everywhere they go, whatever they do, oftentimes they're life schedules or their preferences or their whatever it is about your children start to drive the family, start to drive your thoughts. And then you know, you know, it's a good indicator. Am I raising children with a spiritual mind? Am I raising children to serve God Almighty? You can idolize your marriage. And it doesn't happen just because everything's good all the time and you're obsessed with your spouse, no. You can idolize your marriage when things are bad because it, it really starts to wreck your life and that becomes the ultimate thing. So idols are not just when things are good. In fact, the idol, idolatry of our lives gets exposed the most clearly when that very thing starts to shake or things go wrong. And you can even idolize church, religion, And this is not a call for us to abandon these good things. This is not a call for a Christian asceticism, a monastic life, and to cut yourself off from all these good things in your life. That's not what this is about. This is for us to really think about the treasure of our heart and, and what, what's really sitting there so that we can not just manage life but excel and, and, and do well and, and be free in our spirit as we engage all the good things in life. The story of Daniel and his friends is a perfect example. They excelled in this foreign land of Babylon. They were foreigners. They were without. They were the minority, yet they excelled in the face of so much idolatry. The call for us to abandon idolatry is not for us to, to abandon the good things. It's a disposition of your heart, actually. Daniel and his friends had their hearts set completely on the holiness of God and the glory of God. And in doing so, they had the freedom to be excellent in all their ways. They weren't trying to be excellent in their ways so that they can excel, so that they can fit right, so that they can... It wasn't those things. It was they were obsessed and they were set completely on the glory of God and the holiness of God. We cannot excel in things and then have freedom in God. We must have freedom in God so that we can excel in things in His freedom. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You will serve the very thing that your heart treasures. You will serve it. You will be a slave to it. So what's in your heart? And if in my heart, as I do a, a really very deep assessment of my heart, of what's sitting on the throne of my heart. If I, if I really look deeply inside, what is sitting or who is sitting on the, the throne of my heart? And I recognize that, you know what, it's not God. God's actually not sitting on the throne of my heart. It's not Jesus. You know, a few weeks ago we talked about King Jesus. We don't like to talk about kingship. We don't like to think about authority and power. You know, we have a lot of trouble with those phrases these days. But, you know, Jesus is, is really our good king. Is, is he sitting on your heart? What can win over this idol manufacturing heart of mine when I see that King Jesus is not sitting there? Apostle Paul faced the same dilemma. 
He wasn't free from it. He shared his wrestling in the letter to the Christians in Rome. He says, what I want to do, I do not do. What I do not want to do, I do. Who can save me from this wretchedness? And he says, thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. Only Jesus can save me. Everything I want to do, I don't do. Everything I really don't want to do, I keep doing. So the answer is not found in us trying to remove the idol out of our heart. Only God can do that. It's found in God's grace alone. Only God can invade our hearts and remove that which sits on our throne that is not of God. And grace, that grace is the only way. It comes to us completely at the cost of God. This past week, I wrote one of the daily devotions in regards to the cost of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. When we can see how costly God's grace has been for us, then we can be full of gratitude and live victoriously in that grace. But when we have this illusion that God's grace just somehow just comes to us just magically, or if we think that God's grace comes to us by what, that I've been good, I've been trying hard. I've been a good Christian. I've been trying hard. You'll know this sometimes. You'll catch yourself. I've done this so many times when you're praying and you're wrestling through something and it just, it just kind of spills out of your mouth. You say, but God, I've been trying hard. God, I've been good. God, I've started to go to Bible study. I've been doing my devotions. God, I've started to give a little more to the church. God, I've been serving a little more. That right there. You're trying to access grace that never comes to you by your merits. You're trying to access that grace by your merits. And there we don't have gratitude. And there we are again trapped to the idol manufacturing heart of ours. Consider Solomon. Yes, God gave him that gift, but he started off wrong. It came at the cost of his own great sacrifice. He sacrificed all these bulls. He sacrificed. It came out of his own pocket. And God came to him and, and gave him an answer to his prayer. So the disposition of Solomon's heart was not, oh, this came completely, utterly by grace. I am surrendered to this grace. Solomon had started off by offering God something of his own. But there is no cost that could ever afford our own redemption and forgiveness. It is to our benefit to believe in what Jesus has done, that he paid the price entirely on his own. And our job is to simply open that gift and receive it. How do we overcome this heart that just loves and gravitates towards turning people and things close to us into idols? How do we do that? It's only when we see what Christ has done for us and what treasure Christ has made of us and that finally sets us free. Matthew chapter 13, there's two parables that highlight this so well. It's about the parable of the pearl of great value and the parable of the hidden treasure. The guy who finds this pearl of great price and sells everything to get it. The guy who finds this hidden treasure sells everything to get it. Jesus, Jesus is, the, is the person who sells everything, who gives up everything to go looking for this pearl of great price, who, who purchases the land that the hidden treasure is in. This is, this is who Jesus is, and we are the pearl of great price, and we are the hidden treasure. Only when you and I know what we are worth to Christ can we finally be free from the idol manufacturing hearts that we have. It took Solomon his entire life. And unfortunately, it took Solomon losing everything. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes this at the end of his life. He's an old man, and God has already told him he's going to take the kingdom away from his son. And he writes that there's no meaning or purpose outside of God. He says, everything is meaningless. I've tried, I've tried everything under the sun, and everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He writes Proverbs, and the Proverbs of Solomon writes all about the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You've got to give up your understanding. You've got to give up your wisdom. You've got to give up your thought process. You've got to give up your own experiences that you constantly, continually lean on in trying to navigate life. You've got to give that up. And, and, and Solomon is saying, trust in the Lord. And he's basically saying, listen to me. I've been through it. I really messed up. Listen to my advice. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. 
I came across this, this commentary that, that explains how, how crafty the devil is in getting us to do idol worship in regards to Proverbs 3.5. And his commentary states that there's actually a, a, a satanic text in, in this book called the Book of Beelzebub that has a, a, a almost a parallel text to Proverbs 3, 5. It says, trust in yourself with all your heart and lean on your own understanding. It doesn't say trust in the devil. It doesn't say trust in the serpent, trust in the Satan. It doesn't say that it says trust in yourself with all your heart and lean on your own understanding. And that captures what the serp serpent did to Adam and Eve. You eat this, you will become, your, your eyes will open, you will see, you will understand, you will know. You will become like God. There it is. Satan is not interested in getting us to follow him. He's interested in getting all of us to just look at ourselves. Because by looking at ourselves, we turn away from God. And Solomon is saying, no, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And that's the, that's the hardest thing for us to do. It's harder than giving up some kind of a bad habit. It's harder than giving up some kind of uh, 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 taboo sin. What, 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 what's so hard about turning to God is that we have to stop trusting ourselves. We have to give up understanding of our own selves. And we have to put that before God and say, God, I don't know anything before you. And I need you. That's the call of Christ. Every time someone comes to Jesus and says, God, look, Jesus, look at what I know. Look at what I have. What do you think of this? What do you, and they challenge Jesus. Jesus systematically always breaks them down and shows them that they are completely disqualified. And yet anybody who ever comes to Jesus, completely humble, surrendering, Jesus always lifts them up. That is the way of the gospel. What will you do? God has interlaced his grace throughout your life. He has given you Christ alone to believe in him. And only by believing in him can you finally let go of the idols that run your life. And no, it's not those addictions. The real idols of our life is your family, is your work, is what you have, what you own. Those are the real idols of our life. And if we could pause for a moment today and recognize what positions they have in our lives, that we might be able to actually turn to Christ fully. And maybe some of the, the greatest idols in your life, maybe you're like me, is that it's been about your goodness. Your idol has been about your goodness. Or your morals, or your, your self-righteousness, whatever it is. And surrendering that, surrendering that is perhaps one of the greatest idols that we can lay down before God. And when we do, when we do, you can finally love your family. You can finally navigate your life. You can finally do your work. You can finally manage your finances and possessions with freedom in your spirit. No more fear, no more anxiety over it. You can let it go and let God. And that's when you find, when you can do that, that's you know that the treasure of your heart is Jesus and not any of those things. And the promise is that when you do that, you know, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and then all these other things will be taken care of. Would you hear that invitation? I hear that invitation this morning. I hear that invitation throughout this week. Let's learn from Solomon. Let's learn from him and his mistakes. But let's look at the greater Solomon, Jesus. Jesus, who really did live completely trusting in God alone. And let's receive that from him. And let's trust in God with all of our heart with all of, and, not our, and lean not on our own understanding and discover that that's where the freedom truly is. Amen? Let's pray.